All right, I think we'll get started. Um, I wasn't planning to start with this uh, picture over here, but I found it online just a couple of days ago, and I uh, thought I'd share it with you guys. And uh, I think maybe you guys can maybe shout out a couple of things, but tell me what you're seeing in this picture in terms of technology or framing or anything else. Just shout out some things. A phone. There you go. That's, I think, maybe the most important element. There's a couple of other things. Uh, let me use this pointer over here because we're recording the screen. Uh, they've got mics, external mics. Pretty good. They got lights, which honestly is impressive compared to what we're seeing elsewhere. The phone, while it is a phone, is mounted on a tripod with a mount. Uh, they've got a really nice set. Uh, clearly their presenter knows what they're doing. Uh, but they are running uh, what looks like probably the Facebook app, uh, and they're about to go live over a phone. And uh, we're talking about live streaming in higher education and doing anything over Wi-Fi professionally. Uh, probably not the smartest idea. So we're probably going to be touching on a whole bunch of these elements in the presentation. So let's get into it. So hey everybody, uh, my name is Raul Burriel, I'm from Oregon State University, and I've been doing uh, live streaming on the web since the 90s, uh, back during the uh, real server days. So I think that's going to ring a bell for some of you, and others are going to be like, real what? But yeah. Uh, today's presentation is not about Zoom. In fact, there's another presentation about Zoom right next door, and I'd probably be in that room right now if I wasn't doing this presentation. Uh, for the sake of this presentation, we're, not, uh, we're talking about live streaming. We're not talking about products like Zoom or WebEx or similar tools. Uh, we, uh, at least on our campus, and I try to do this very much, and other people don't, uh, we call these tools web collaboration tools. Uh, and they're an opportunity to create an engaging interactive experience, usually between an individual or a group of presenters and an audience. Uh, generally speaking, we're talking about Q&As, breakout rooms, and so forth. That is not exactly what live streaming is. Live streaming is largely broadcast broadcast through protocols that are an alphabet soup of things you don't really need to know about. Uh, my note for this caption actually says, don't worry about it. Uh, these protocols are not going to weigh on you as you look at live streaming solutions because all the vendors are going to do this for you. Uh, RTMP, uh, HTTP live streaming, SRT is an interesting one that is a new live streaming protocol that's evolving right now. Um, the technology you're going to be using for live streaming in the future will cover these technologies, uh, so don't worry about it. Uh, live streaming, what do we live stream? Academic content, sure, uh, that's also something that might go out over a web collaboration tool like Zoom. Uh, athletics, uh, sporting events or even interviews with the coach on the field during the training, uh, events. Events are pretty big for live streaming. Uh, uh, chapel services, uh, keynote speaks, uh, speakers, uh, informational content, uh, candidate presentations. A lot of those, frankly, can go over uh, products like Zoom and WebEx. And others, sometimes, they don't lend themselves well to that. So a live stream is a better solution. Uh, what's important here is uh, where do we stream? We stream from anywhere, and that's going to be a problem. It's going to be a problem on your campus because you're not always going to have the bandwidth you need to stream, so that's going to be a solution you're going to have to find. Uh, are you really going to have to stream over, over wireless? If you've got someone doing an interview with the coach on the field during practice, they're probably going to be on Wi-Fi when they do that, so how do you accommodate that in a way that guarantees a reliable connection that doesn't break up. And that live stream has to go to anywhere. Your audience might be on a mobile device. It might be an Android, it might be an iPhone, they might be using their laptop, their a Windows computer, a Mac computer. 
Uh, they might be down the street, they might be in the other building next door, they might be in China. How are they going to watch your live stream? Um, this one, a little bit cynical. Why do we stream? Because they're paying us. Uh, it's cynical and ultimately the real answer is a client has come to you and they told you they want to live stream something. Uh, there might not be a better solution for what they're asking for. Uh, a live stream might be what they want. Uh, we run a number of live streams where we get virtually no viewers. Uh, I'm sure that is not unique to us, but it is what the client wanted. Uh, so that is what we will do. Uh, one of the reasons for a live stream might be accessibility. Uh, you might have a cohort of uh, viewers who simply cannot get to the venue for whatever reason. You send that out over a live stream, they can watch it from their office or the comfort of their own home. And that also addresses uh, reaching a remote audience. You might have the provost doing a presentation to all your faculty. First, the venue might not accommodate all your faculty. Second, the venue might be across campus. Uh, the provost might be in another city doing a presentation to uh, alumni, but you want the campus to be able to see that. Uh, people don't necessarily want to have to drive out to see a presentation, especially if it's only going to be a 30-minute presentation or lecture, putting it live over the internet. Uh, that's how you get to your remote audience and you get that engagement factor. Uh, why do people watch your live stream? The feeling of being there, the sense of community, a sense of newness. There is, there is surprisingly, a, a surprising amount of research that has gone into this. Uh, people will not watch a live stream after it's, after it's started or they will not go back and watch the first five minutes if they've missed it. Uh, who here watched that Star Wars celebration panel last week online? What about, the, uh, what about the Disney Plus event that Disney did two weeks ago? Or the Apple, uh, Apple TV event that happened three weeks ago? All right. Would anybody actually open up their laptop and watch that presentation now? It happened already. Nobody wants to go back and watch it. It was really new and exciting when it happened. And at the Apple event, they brought Steven Spielberg out on stage and Oprah. Wow, that's exciting. But no one's going to go back and watch it anymore. It's, it's old news. You have to watch it in real time and you have to make sure your audience knows it's happening in real time because a recorded event just doesn't work anymore. No one wants to go back and watch it. Let's talk a little bit about the production of a live stream. If there's, anything, if there's one important factor you take away from this presentation is that a live stream is not an excuse to compromise on production quality. Live streaming is simply a different broadcast medium. It doesn't mean that you get to cheap out on any kind of production quality. This, this is a TV news uh, broadcast control room. This is a live streaming suite. Another live streaming suite. This is NBC Sports uh, broadcast studio for, uh, in Stanford, Connecticut, uh, what they use for the Olympics. Everything you see on that screen there, it's not going out on TV. It's going out live streamed over the internet. NBC spent millions of dollars building this out. Millions of dollars for live streaming. And frankly, that's a little bit scary. Uh, this is our broadcast space. Uh, that's Christina there on the right. In fact, you'll see her around here somewhere. Uh, but uh, in this case, we're broadcasting commencement. Uh, we've, got, uh, we've got a number of people, camera operators, uh, full-on production suite going on here. I'm not saying you, er, you need to do something like this for a live stream every single time. This is a high-end capstone every year, frankly. But what do you need for live streaming? Professional cameras. Don't use your phone. Don't lose, don't lose your phone unless you have to. Professional microphones. Sure, Sennheiser. Good stuff. We've all seen these. Uh, video switchers. That always helps. Uh, audio mixers. 
always useful, especially if you have more than one uh, speaker, more than one microphone. Uh, we're live, well, we're not live streaming this, but we're seeing something very similar happening in the back of the room right there with mixers, switchers. So all this is the production in the house, the stuff you're not supposed to be compromising on. It's what we've been doing for years, whether we were creating content to go out over our campus TV network or record it so we can uh, deliver it later on. Just because it's live doesn't mean we should be compromising. Let's look a little bit at the encoding. Once you get all of this put together in a, cert in a pipe, essentially, one cable, you put it into something like, something like this. These are devices from uh, Teradek, Elemental, iVision. Uh, Niagara is still in the market here. Generally, it's one plug, HDSDI, something like that. You feed it all in there, and this takes care. This is what's going to take care of those protocols for you, HLS, RTMP, SRT, and put it out to the web for you. But it's not the only thing. These rack-mounted devices, generally, they're five figures in terms of costs, and we're not all going to be able to afford something like this. Then we have uh, devices like these. Matrox Monarch, Matrox is here. Talk to them about their Monarch. It's a streaming device. It does RTMP streaming. Uh, Epifans Pro device, uh, Blackmagic Web Presenter. A couple of other devices there. Uh, the little Teradek video over there. That you can mount that right on top of the camera. Not a big fan of it. It is a seriously underpowered device. Uh, not particularly reliable. Uh, First step uh, in using that device is reboot it. Hopefully it works. Make sure the firmware is up to date. Uh, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's an option. It's certainly an economical option. And then you've got things like this, an all-in-one solution from TriCaster. You've got your mixer, your switcher, uh, an encoder down at the bottom over there. Your entire production suite all-in-one. Uh, I think we all understand in AV that when you buy something that does everything, it doesn't do anything particularly well. Uh, but uh, budgets sometimes dictate that we go with a solution like this. And then, anybody recognize what this is? I think a lot of us have one of these on campus. This is an EEG captions encoder. Uh, that is for accessibility purposes. Uh, we have been using these uh, in athletic events for years before we ever, ever considered using one of these for live streaming. Uh, but generally it handles your standard captions formats like 604 uh, and, uh, and a lot of the streaming standards out there will accommodate those, uh, those protocols. So if you get captions fed into this and you can deliver this into your pipe, into your SDI that goes into your encoder, those captions will then be decoded and, and delivered to your viewing audience in, in the player. Uh, a lot of people aren't considering the captioning accessibility component of live streaming, uh, which is going to quickly become a problem as people start getting sued for not delivering accessible content live over the web. Just because it's transient, just because it only happens for 30 minutes once, doesn't mean you don't have to make it accessible. There is some consideration regarding accommodation. If you can add the captions to a live event after the fact to a, to a recording, uh, oftentimes that is considered an accommodation, a reasonable accommodation. But if you can deliver those captions live as well, while a little bit more costly than doing it after the fact, uh, it's, a, it's a good nod to your audience. Finally, uh, well, actually not quite finally, but then there's the streaming of it all. You've got it into your encoder, and then you point your encoder to one of many different solutions out there. Uh, Facebook Live, YouTube, Twitch, Kaltura does live streaming, uh, Twitter's Periscope, uh, IBM Cloud Video. Does anybody remember what IBM Cloud Video used to be called? Does anybody remember Ustream? That's IBM Cloud Video. Uh, Vimeo does live streaming. Does anybody remember what that used to be called? Livestream.com. Vimeo decided they wanted to do live streaming and they just bought live stream. So if you go to Livestream.com, it takes you to Vimeo now. Uh, some of these are free. Uh, I see four free ones on there. Facebook, Twitch, YouTube, and Periscope. Uh, some of these uh, carry an extra cost. And then it depends on what you want to do. 
Uh, there's paid services, there's professional services. Uh, if you're doing something with captions, you have to consider which ones of these actually accommodate captions. Uh, we're looking at video delivery quality. We're looking at reliability. Is your live stream gonna go down in the middle of your event? We're looking at copyright. Uh, content ID on YouTube is, uh, is fun. Uh, I call it fun because I could call it other things. Uh, but you could be live streaming an event and uh, your speaker has decided to put uh, 30 seconds of a, uh, uh, the latest Ariana Grande song into their PowerPoint presentation. Uh, that's gonna be fun on YouTube because YouTube is going to recognize that you're running that Ariana Grande song. Now, Content ID on a live event these days won't necessarily shut you down, but it will flag your video. It will recognize that you've put copyrighted content on your live stream. Uh, generally, after your live stream is over, uh, especially if you do delivery through YouTube, uh, your recordings go into your video library. They don't necessarily become available after the fact unless you click a couple of flags on YouTube and say, I'd like my recording to become available after the fact. Um, none of my recordings go live after the fact. Uh, so I don't pay too much attention to that, but I have gone into my YouTube content library recently and gone through the YouTube live streams I've had there and I've noticed just how many of those are flagged for content. Uh, there are different degrees of flagging for content on YouTube from the this video can't be monetized to the this video will be monetized but the money will go to somebody else to the full on you've ripped off somebody else we're flagging you if you get three flags we're shutting down your channel. Uh, so YouTube good for live streaming dangerous for live streaming. Generally I suggest you count on two different live stream outlets uh, so that when one of them goes sideways, you have a second one. I would suggest you look at one free one and one paid one and mix it up. Oh, and all the way down at the bottom, uh, who's heard of Microsoft Stream? Oh, there's a couple of you. Uh, who here has Office 365 uh, on their campus? You all have Microsoft Stream. You all have it. It is Microsoft's video delivery platform, and it is built into Office 365. It is a full-on video delivery platform. If you, if you manage to find where it is, it looks, it looks like a YouTube portal. It looks like a Kaltura portal. It is a video delivery platform from Microsoft, and it delivers video just like all the other ones do, and it does it live. Nobody uses it, no one's aware of it, but it is there, it exists, and you probably have it on your campus. So consider it as an option, uh, part of your uh, bag of tricks, but not your only option. Oh, captioning, not all of these accommodate captioning. YouTube does, Kaltura does, I think Ustream, uh, IBM Cloud Video, Vimeo both do, uh, but neither of those are particularly economical solutions. And uh, even at the uh, tiered levels, like uh, Vimeo's live stream solution, where you have a entry level package and a higher level package, if you want to do things like captioning, you generally have to look at the higher level packages, which generally cost thousands of dollars a month to uh, contract. And then delivery. Where are people going to see your live stream? Because I'll tell you honestly, uh, just because you're putting it out there, just because you build it doesn't mean they will come. They don't know it's there unless you tell them about it. Uh, this is ESPN's video delivery portal, uh, sometimes called, well, currently called ESPN Plus. It's been called ESPN3. It's been called Watch ESPN. Uh, ESPN Plus is broadly used for their paid video delivery platform, but you see their free content here as well. Uh, you're going to recognize this layout because it's rather ubiquitous in the video portal world. This is the Pac-12 video delivery platform. Looks uh, very much like the one we just saw. This is uh, our current uh, webcam delivery portal. Uh, not a particularly appealing uh, design. We have 16 different live webcams running on campus right now. Uh, 
it's getting redesigned to that. If that looks familiar, it's because it looks exactly like the ESPN and Pac-12 portals. Uh, this was, as of uh, yesterday, our old uh, live streaming portal, which is different than our webcam delivery portal. Uh, we put all our live events here. This is what it looks like today. We just switched over. Again, look and feel very similar to the ESPN and uh, uh, Pac-12 one. There's, there's benefits to this. There is your hero video, your main featured video. This is what everybody's come here to see. You told them to come to this website and hopefully have a simple URL to uh, navigate them there. In this case, it's live.oregonstate.edu. Uh, you have upcoming events on the side. You have other live streams that might be happening right now. And down at the bottom, some uh, past recorded live events that might be of benefit to your audience. Uh, generally, people don't navigate to this website unless they're going there actively, proactively, for an event that's happening right now. Uh, it would be wonderful if people just thought to, you know, browse to your website and say, oh, let's see what's live right now. We are not quite there yet, but people are getting accustomed at least to the website. So when they do hear, hey, there's a live event, they seem to understand, let's go live.oregonstate.edu. If it's not here, then this is very much a carrot and stick scenario. If you want to be on this website, you come through our production services we can at least guarantee a bare minimum of quality. We have those quality cameras, we have those quality microphones, we have uh, professionals running switchers and mixers, we are running through reliable encoding to a reliable streaming destination. Uh, others might choose to live stream their content, but we're not gonna put them here if they can't show that they're creating quality content. So this is the carrot people at least know the website and they and when they hear it's a live stream I'm gonna to go to this website if they're not seeing it here then it must be because it's someone else running their own operation on campus because that's what happens on campus and finally this is finally uh, promoting how do people know about your live stream uh, again the client comes to us and they say they want to live stream this presentation they want to live stream this candidate interview because they have a series uh, they have people in a hiring committee and they can't come to the venue today um, so maybe your intended audience is just one two or three people and it's fine if that communication goes out via email uh, but maybe you've got something, uh, something bigger. Maybe you've got something that you want. You've got a, a famous keynote speaker, so an event happening that evening at your event center, and you want, uh, and your speaker has agreed to sign the waiver that lets you live stream. Because remember to have them sign that waiver. You don't want them to show up and have them see the cameras and say, whoop, I didn't agree to this. Uh, and, but you want people to watch that. Your event center is full, sold out. You want the audience to watch. Um, so you send out the emails, you put it on your events calendar, uh, and you try to, you try to promote it uh, on social media, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. What's happened in the last year or so is if you're using any of these social media platforms for your live stream, uh, when you go live, you appear on what they call the top of the stack. If you're on Facebook and you stream live through your university face, uh, university's Facebook channel, anyone who is subscribed or is following you on Facebook, they get that notification, they get that alert. When they go to Facebook uh, in their app or uh, in their browser, at the top of the page, they'll say, hey, Oregon State University is live streaming right now. Um, same thing with YouTube. Uh, if someone's uh, subscribed to you on YouTube, uh, notifications, you go to youtube.com, you go to the YouTube app, right there at the top of the page. Same thing on Twitter, at the top of the page. Hey, this person you're following, this person you're subscribed to, they're live streaming right now. That is how we're frankly catching a lot of flies right now because uh, as much as we want our uh, clients who are paying us to live stream to promote their event, it's just not getting out. It goes out via email. No one's reading their emails anymore. Too many emails, nobody reads them. Uh, no one goes to an events calendar to see, hey, what events are happening tonight? So social media is basically the way to get the word out when 
uh, when you live stream and you hope uh, to use a channel that actually has a lot of subscribers. Uh, if your channel has 20 subscribers, you're, the max audience you're getting for that live stream is 20 uh, because no one else is going to notice. So you have to build up your channels. You have to get, the, uh, get that awareness out. You have to tweet. You have to Facebook. You have to YouTube. You have to let people know that you're going to be live streaming to get, in order to get that audience built out. And finally, analytics. After your live stream's over, what is your product giving you in terms of your audience? Are they geolocating? Are they telling you where your audience was coming from? Uh, are they telling you what parts of the event were most engaging? You can get graphs that'll show you, especially on platforms like YouTube uh, and platforms like Kaltura, that'll show you uh, peak hotspots where this is where your audience came in. You can generally correlate that with your social media marketing. At 15 minutes into my live event, I sent out a tweet and suddenly there was a little spike in my audience. Um, if you don't get those analytics, you can't get ba go back to your client and tell them this is, how many audi uh, this is how many people we had watching. At the same time, you can go back to your clients and say, hey, we only had two people watching. Uh, if, you, uh, if we want to do this again, uh, let's work on a plan for promoting your event and, uh, and getting that word out. Next time they want us to work with you in terms of social media, they want us to promote your event for you. This is generally not things we would do on someone's behalf without them giving us to say so. We are not going to be uh, spamming social media on behalf of a client unless they've given us the green light to do something like that because we don't really necessarily understand the audience. We are the tool for delivering that content not the tool for promoting that content. Uh, in terms of your analytics, what's going to be most important, the single biggest analytical number in those stats is what they call the peak concurrent viewers. Uh, at any one time, what was the most number of people watching? Uh, it's, it's, in one sense, it's really the only useful analytic. Uh, beyond looking at maybe IP addresses, because some people navigate away and come back. Uh, um, some people open up a browser more than once for whatever reason. In terms, uh, but a peak concurrent viewers will tell you how many people you had watching at one single time during that live stream. And you might have five or six at the beginning and three or four at the end, but in the middle, if you had 90 peak, that means 90 different individuals were watching that event. So peak concurrent viewers is going to be the one single biggest analytic you're going to want uh, when looking at your uh, live stream analytics. And that is the end of my presentation. That was fast. I covered a lot. And do we have any questions? Come on, guys. We've got a catch box. Who here is doing live streaming? Hands up. What are some of the platforms you're streaming out of? What's that? Panopto. Mediamp. Are Mediamp still moving over to Kaltura for Mediamp? Yeah. Yep. So yeah, getting uh, getting that live stream out early uh, and absolutely running full motion video rather than color bars. Uh, you wouldn't be, or maybe you would be, shocked by how often you start with color bars and then uh, as soon as you switch over to live content, maybe a minute or two before the event starts and everything goes haywire. Uh, you'd think that color bars would be enough, but no, that, 
uh, for whatever reason, systems don't seem to like you switching to full motion from color bars right before your event starts. It always seems to want to sabotage you. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yep. Some of the uh, live stream platforms out there have uh, uh, waiting rooms and dashboards where you can uh, preview content. YouTube, Kaltura both uh, give you this. You can essentially uh, watch the live stream as an admin before you ever actually click the button to go live. Uh, and and uh, YouTube in particular has a countdown uh, to, your, uh, to the date and time of the start of your event. So you can pre, uh, 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 well, pre-configure your event, uh, set a date and time, and you will have essentially a kind of like a slide that counts down until the start of your event so that your audience can visit that uh, web page and realize, oh, I need to come back in, say, 40 hours, and your event will be there. So uh, these, uh, these stationary slides are useful to keep your uh, audience informed, and, uh, for, and with the uh, YouTube tool in particular, they can set a little bell to uh, give them a reminder when the event starts. What about in terms of encoding? There's a lot of encoding hardware solutions out there. The uh, Teradex solutions are economical, uh, even going up to the rack-mounted slice device. Uh, a lot of people have to use uh, the uh, video, which is a little uh, uh, camera-mounted device. Um, uh, Teradex also makes a uh, little bonding device uh, that bonds uh, a number of wireless networks, both uh, 3G and 4G, as well as Wi-Fi, and gives you one somewhat reliable wireless signal when you are on location uh, and you have no cable to get you back to the network. Uh, sometimes that's your only solution. What uh, the use cases for doing something like that on location, though, are tricky. Uh, we've considered it in scenarios like uh, at commencement, where we have our students gathering, we have our students march into the stadium before, uh, during a commencement. Uh, so we have students gather in certain, uh, at certain rally points on campus. And uh, we've considered sending out uh, crews on location, man on the street kind of things, where we interview the students before they go into the stadium. Uh, the issue is that we don't want to encode on the camera itself with, uh, with a little Teradek video device or what have you uh, because we want that content to go back to our control room and then switch to it when we're ready. So scenarios like that require a considerable amount of network engineering. Uh, we look at solutions like microwave antennas and very long network cables. Uh, wireless uh, 3G, 4G, Wi-Fi bonding solutions, particularly when you're surrounded by hundreds or thousands of students, are not necessarily going to be particularly reliable. Uh, so uh, in, in a scenario like that one where we have men on the street, uh, we want to be able to get that back to a control room uh, where our director can mix that content in when he's ready, and then we'd stream it out to an appliance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes. Yeah, the, uh, the TriCaster solution is a serviceable all-in-one. Let me see if we can get back to that picture. This one here. You'll see down at the bottom of the screen is, uh, is the appliance that runs all of that, and built into that is the streaming uh, component as well that you can then use to stream out to something like uh, YouTube or Twitch. It's, uh, it's been used uh, for a few years now in terms of uh, a lot of the um, 
social media, uh, YouTube type of uh, video production solutions. It's, it's, it's a turnkey functional solution. I mean, that is a very robust uh, video uh, switcher and mixer they have right there, well beyond what most of us use even in, uh, in professional production. So it's, it's not bad, but uh, when you've already got your suites outfitted with Sony and Panasonic equipment, you don't necessarily need all of this. You just need that one single appliance for the encoding. Mm -hmm. Yep. The uh, backup encoder solution is actually something that a lot of people uh, are, are looking at these days. Uh, when you want to go out live, one path essentially gives you one single point of failure. Uh, so you want multiple different encoders and multiple different uh, streaming services. Uh, it makes it tricky. Uh, when uh, you're telling people to go to this website to watch the live stream and something goes sideways, to get that alternate live stream up and running is difficult to communicate to your intended audience. Uh, oftentimes they just need to reload the web page and see if maybe there's something different happening now than there was earlier. Uh, captioning. For those of you who are live streaming, is anybody captioning their content? Not a lot of people are considering it, but the truth is the solutions exist right now. Uh, a lot of this was simply discovered through trial and error. You didn't realize, not a lot of people frankly promote the fact that you can live, uh, you can caption your live streams. Uh, we, uh, for a number of the platforms we use for live streaming, uh, we simply fed captions into the video and discovered, hey, the CC button on this player works now. That's how you discover things. Uh, hitting the button turns the captions on, hitting the button again turns them off. There's alternatives to captioning. Uh, stream text is a way of getting essentially a, uh, uh, a little iframe of HTML to appear next to a video uh, on a web page. Uh, and a captioning service can feed text into that box, uh, into that iframe. Uh, you can open caption, which is essentially you burn the, the text onto the video. You can't turn them off. They're always there all the time. Um, but when you're creating content for television or broadcasts, uh, our commencement goes out over a broadcast television channel. Uh, that must be captioned. So it's just a couple of extra cables to uh, feed those same captions into our live stream as well. And a number of the platforms out there now will uh, accommodate the, uh, the captions and recognize that you're using uh, uh, standards compliant uh, SD or actually it's ATSC or NTSC caption standards and, and will decode them and deliver them properly over the web. Any questions? I think we'll be wrapping up early then. All right, thank you guys.